Welcome everyone. This is Leslie Pelch at the Vermont Center for Geographic Information. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Mapping for Emergency Management with Talbot Brooks. And uh, before we get started today, I'm going to do a brief overview intro thing where we all just review how the, the GoToWebinar interface works and make sure we're all on the same page in terms of using it. And it gives you an opportunity to let me know if there's any issues or if anybody's not hearing me out there. So hopefully you all see the screen that I have on my computer, which shows a few bullets and the icons that you should be seeing on the edge of your panel. So the first thing I want to point out is that in order to open and close your panel, you'll click on this orange button with the white arrow in it. And um, so if you find that the panel is taking up too much space on your screen and you just want it out of the way, just click that to, to uh, close it up and then click it to open it back up if you want to see the information in the panel. Um, you can submit questions at any time by typing them into the question box. Um, you're all muted, so you don't have to worry about sounds going on in the background in your office. Um, but you can type those question in, questions in at any time, and they will come to me, so you don't have to worry about interrupting Talbot. Um, if it seems like a question that does need to be answered right away, I will interrupt him or pass it along to him and let him know it's there. Um, otherwise, we'll probably save most of the questions till the end, and then I'll, I'll pass them along to him, read them out. Um, let's see. Oh, if you have any issues with audio right now, notice that there's an audio section of your panel that you can open up and you can change some settings in there, including uh, whether you're using a telephone or mic and speaker. So if you need to change that, if you decide to switch to telephone, don't use the phone number that you see here. See the, use the one that you actually see in your own panel. Um, and then the final thing in terms of this using the panel is there's a little button that looks like an orange hand with a green arrow on it. That's the raising hands button. And if everybody who can hear me would go ahead and click on that just to let me know that you can hear me. That really helps me out. Thank you. Oh, just a few. There we go. <laughs> everybody could click on that. Great. Thank you. Uh, and then the final thing I want to mention is the fact that this, this webinar is being recorded. Um, Hopefully this time I'm not going to have technical issues with the recording. Last time Talbot actually gave this this presentation a few weeks ago and my uh, recording had, was corrupt. It, I couldn't upload it to YouTube. So that's why we're doing this again today as well as to offer you another opportunity to, to hear the uh, webinar, to see the webinar. And so I just want to show you how you can get to that recorded webinar once it's posted. Right here on the front page of the VCGI website, down in the kind of bottom left, not quite all the way at the bottom, but on the left it says connect with us and there are a number of little icons that lead you to various types of social media and different ways that you can connect both with VCGI and the Vermont GIS community. The one all the way on the right is a YouTube icon. So if you click on that it takes you to our YouTube channel and you can see that we've got all of our recent webinars posted here and I've gotten really good about remembering to post stuff pretty quickly. So. I should be able to post this tomorrow and uh, or by, well, tomorrow or the end of the week at the latest. And so you'll see it here. And if for some reason you, you can also just go to YouTube and search for Vermont Geospatial as a way to get to that. Um, and I think that's about it. So remember, if you have any questions, you can send them to me, whether they're related to the presentation or if you're having any kind of technical difficulties, um, feel free to send those. And I think at this time, I'm going to hand things over to Talbot. And we shall see which of his monitors shows up. OK. OK. So what I see, yep, what I see is, where are we? Emergency Management, GIS, and Data Mining. All right. Now, I'll forewarn you all, uh, if you need translation services from Mississippi to Yankee, uh, Leslie can probably hop in and lend a hand. Is this loud enough? Uh, you're, you're just barely loud enough, so yeah, as much as you can project your voice as possible, that'd be great. All right, here we go then. Let's go for a ride. Uh, I wanted to share first, kind of, and this has been mixed up a little since I last presented, 
but I wanted to share a little bit about myself and where I'm coming from. My first job actually was as a career firefighter in a suburb of Boston. I started on the job in uh, 1987, and I continue this day as a first responder working fire uh, and emergency operations as a volunteer. I'm too fat and lazy to crawl down smoke-filled hallways, so I stand in the front yard or on the fire truck as either the chief or the engineer nowadays, but I still have my hand in this uh, quite a bit. So it's over the course of over 20 years of uh, boots on ground as an emergency responder that I share this perspective, and it's just that. It's a perspective. There's not a whole lot of right or wrong here. But in the emergency services community, uh, we've learned some lessons the hard way. And when we learn a lesson the hard way, it's usually because somebody gets killed or we have massive smoking ruins left around after the fact. And on screen here is an example of that. In 1904, the city of Baltimore caught fire. And Baltimore Fire showed up and quickly learned that it was much better, bigger than what they could handle. So they called for help. And help came from as far away as Newark, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., and all these other fire companies showed up at this giant conflagration and went to hook to the fire hydrants and went, uh-oh, we have a problem. And the problem was this. They used different hose threads than what the city of Baltimore used. So all of a sudden you take hundreds of firefighters and turn them into what we call spectators because they couldn't use their apparatus. and things just were not interoperable. So we learned that lesson the hard way, and you think we'd, we'd have understood that going forward, but as recent as 9-11, and even hereafter, we can point to tons and tons of horrible examples where things like radio systems were not interoperable. So messages to evacuate the building or to pay attention to something just don't get through when we're working a large incident. I say all this because <clears throat> it's through these painful lessons that we've come up with some fundamental tenets in emergency response. We are standards-based organizations. Uh, first and foremost, we try very hard to provide a fundamental standard of care. You would hope that a paramedic here from Mississippi showing up to treat you when you're having a heart attack would have the same expertise and be able to provide the same standard of care as one up there in Vermont. It's, it's, it's a critical element. Next, as mentioned, we, we've learned interoperability and interchangeability. My fire truck here, I know with absolute certainty I can drive up to Burlington and hook to a fire hydrant up there with absolutely no problem anymore. However, I can tell you I still can't talk to you on the radio. We seek organizational consistency, and this is through things like the National Incident Management System and the Incident Command System. Uh, this is a, a flexible structure by which we manage and approach incidents within the emergency response world. Uh, in short, there can only be one incident commander or one fire chief running the show on scene. You get more than that, you create incredible operational confusion and it is an express ticket to getting somebody hurt or killed. Both of those concepts, NIMS and ICS, are strongly vested in another very critical core idea, and that is of scalability. As an incident grows, and hopefully it doesn't, but you've got to be prepared for it to do so, you can bolt on modules of responders, of managers, of logistics for finance and administration onto this command structure so that you can grow the response or contract the response as the event changes scale. Now, for a regular house fire, this may not be super important, but when you're dealing with a large storm event or a tornado or a wildfire, this is an absolute critical requirement. And then lastly here, kind of the big picture idea that I want to provide to you is that Continuity of operations is also absolutely critical. Uh, just because it's 5 o'clock and my shift is supposed to end doesn't mean I get to go home. The incident has to be resolved, or I have to have 
somebody following in to take over my duties and responsibilities through some type of transition period. So this is, it can remain shift work, but there has got to be this continuity of operations. And coupled to that, and understanding when I come in to take over for somebody or they're coming in to take over for me is that common operating picture. Now, we hear about that an awful lot in DHS land and out there in FEMA world, but I've yet to really and truly see it function the way it should, particularly from a geospatial basis. Now, why are these things important? Well, it's because when the incident occurs, is not the time to get creative and innovate. If you don't train and practice geospatial as part of a multidisciplinary emergency or crisis response ahead of time, if you don't have SOPs, if you don't know who your local fire and police chief are, what the chain of command is going to look like, how you're going to achieve that standard of care, how you're going to achieve interoperability, how you plug into the incident command system, all of those bullets. If you don't have the answers to those questions, stay home. Because <clears throat> I, I use the analogy and I show a photograph here, you know, would you like me to show up when you've wrecked your automobile and are trapped inside, and I'm going to show up with a brand new set of jaws of life. I've never used them before. They're just out of the box. I just put them on the truck. Is that going to make you feel terribly comfortable? Or is your hope that I would have practiced and used that tool set dozens and dozens of times so that I know how it's going to respond and how it fits into the task at hand? In other words, the solutions that we choose to use have to be vetted, tested, and trained upon, and we have to do this together. Unfortunately, unless you guys are an exception, you most certainly may well be, GIS is not well integrated into the emergency management world at all. And furthermore, there's lots of really good-hearted folks with geospatial skills that want to come lend a hand and give me that map. But if I haven't trained or practiced with it, the probability of me using it to achieve a better outcome is just as high as me using it, misinterpreting what I'm looking at, and screwing things up in a really raw fashion. And I show some examples of this. These are from live incidents. Um, and I draw on those of you who know me, I am very passionate about a coordinate system called the US National Grid. Um, some folks had wanted to insert it into various crises. So you see in the upper right, this is the grid zone junction for New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. And I can tell you that is not how a zone junction is supposed to look. It's supposed to have a nice zipper effect. So a certain four-letter agency hosed that up in a very big way. Over at left is uh, the same type of data. It is MGRS, or the Military Grid Reference System, overlay that was provided by a four-letter company for use during uh, the Haiti earthquake. And again, you can see, uh, those of you who are familiar with UTM, it's supposed to have nice little square lines. Everything meets at right angles. Yet we got a couple of these tweakers flying in at some type of 30-degree angle or offset slightly from where they should be. If I'm providing location to a responder and going to give them a coordinate on a map to go read, and I've got my grid line showing up like this, y'all, I'm going to send them to the wrong place. And again, that's an opportunity to hurt or kill somebody. So while I respect that our geospatial hearts are in the right place, there's a fundamental question we have to ask ourselves uh, for in, in providing this sort of assistance. Are we willing and able to risk our lives on our maps? Are they that good? Do you understand how that product is going to get used? Did you make it correctly? Do you understand the need for what you're being asked to, to create? If not, hit the pause button and go over and talk to that fire chief or that emergency manager because you're asking them to risk their lives on your map product. It may not seem like it, but when I start integrating a geospatial product into a response, 
it is no different than the protective equipment that I wear, no different than my air pack. It is a tool that I am going to risk my life on and trust that it's right. And a lot of times we see this interoperability issue pop up as well as part of this. Um, my red squares have moved a little here in projecting it, but I just wanted to point out some real subtle but very important issues here. These are two, quote, standard symbology sets for use in land search and rescue. They've both been approved and implemented in a couple of different communities that often come and have to work together. And you see down here towards the bottom that an incident base in one symbol set is shown as the letter B in boldface, and it's supposed to be colored blue. Whereas when I come over and look at the same map symbol over here, it's the letter B in a circle that's also done in blue. Now, could that potentially create some operational friction? Absolutely, because if you actually started drilling down through this, you also note that sometimes trail blockers, which is another search and rescue type of thing, those are folks that follow behind the search party, that if little Susie pops out of the woods after the initial group going through looking for her uh, uh, has startled her and she's emerged from wherever she's hiding or afraid, those trail blockers pick her up. In the second symbol set, trail blockers are shown as that bold letter B. So it can create quite a bit of operational friction and confusion just because we haven't standardized. So part of what I also want to convey is that, and I've encountered this time and time again, um, is that the crisis or emergency response is not about us as the geospatial professionals. It's oftentimes very easy to lose sight and dig in and be the, the consummate GIS professional trying to achieve a task and forget about the people that we're supporting. We tend to sometimes lose sight about, hey, all right, this is how map product needs to look or feel. You might have been trained differently, but this is what the responder or the folks who are requesting your product have set as requirements. You have to keep that at the core of what you're trying to do because this is all about the preservation of life and property that's facilitated by emergency responders who are the users of your products. You've got to stay connected to them. I've seen time and time again where GIS folks get involved in this and they have some really great ideas but they're really great ideas for a GIS professional who are often very, very smart people, but they don't understand how that product's going to get used in the field. A real easy example of this is, well, we're going to do digital data collection when we're doing a damage assessment and roll out a smartphone app. Well, sometimes take your smartphone into that environment that you're doing a house-to-house -house search or doing a damage assessment. And look at the environment in which those responders are working. They're working with big, heavy gloves. Does that smartphone work? No. It, it's a very tough thing to work those applications with big, fat, heavy gloves on. Or even ask, is there still a cell phone connection to, 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 to move the data around? Right? It's a great idea, but it hasn't been field tested. It didn't get integrated into training and preparedness type of stuff. And it wasn't evaluated in terms of the actual needs of the people on the ground. So without beating the horse anymore, I just wanted to kind of provide that overview from the emergency response perspective to kind of sometimes reawaken, oh, geez, this is how things might need to be or might need to go. Um, all that said, GIS can play an absolutely critical role in how a response or, in fact, the larger emergency management picture unfolds. Spatial technologies is applicable to emergency response in all phases of the, the emergency management life cycle. If you're unfamiliar with this, emergency management follows a cycle. It is planning, we kind of sit back and play Steven Spielberg and imagine what horrible things can go wrong in our communities. And in doing so then, 
we move on to the next step, which is hazard mitigation. We figured out what kinds of things can go wrong. And then often, in terms of investment, it's much, much cheaper to go ahead and do what we call mitigation activities. Let's trim all the trees back from the power lines, because doing that is far less expensive than having to pick up and put up new power lines after a storm rolls through. That's a great place to insert GIS. In fact, our state hazard mitigation plan down here in Mississippi is driven almost completely by spatial analysis. And we've started into a, a new track of this where we're looking not just at natural hazards, but we're looking at the interdependencies of infrastructure. Where do the power lines, gas pipelines, oil pipelines, and roads all come together. So if we had a failure of one system, it could cause a cascading failure across many. That's mitigation and prevention. Then we move into the response uh, portion of this life cycle. That's uh, pretty obvious. Something goes bad, and now we've got to put responders in the field. Well, how they get there and what resources are put on target, those are all GIS tasks that we can, we can facilitate. And then lastly, we have recovery after something bad has happened. We need to figure out, OK, where are we setting up uh, displaced persons uh, facilities? How are we delivering food and water and medical assistance? And how do we move those things and transition them over time? Again, GIS can plug into all of these aspects of the overall life cycle. Emergency management um, is very structured and compartmentalized. And this is moving away from just the fire department picture to a multidisciplinary type of event, say a large storm. At the bottom of the slide, you see uh, a Mississippi State Emergency Operations Center. Now, I'm fond to say that Mississippi is last in everything with the exception of being first in the number of disasters and crises that happen down here. We've got everything from ice storms and severe winter storms in the northern part of the state to hurricanes in the south and tornadoes and earthquakes. You know, we're right across from the New Madrid Fault. So <clears throat> Mississippi's kind of loaded for bear when it comes to dealing with crisis now. We, we learned our lesson. And you see the floor of the Emergency Operations Center here. Up top in the back is the governor's conference room. We've got managers at the back of the room. And then individual what we call emergency service functions uh, uh, are sitting out on the floor. Uh, and information moves from the front of the room to the back and then up. And you can see we always have some form of GIS up and running on the screen in this room. We organize and run this according to the Incident Command System, or ICS. And uh, that's free classes that you can go get. I'll give the URLs uh, shortly. They, they take about an hour uh, each. There's four total. So that you can start learning about how emergency management functions. Because again, if you want to show up and put GIS into the picture, if you don't understand this chain of command and how things are function, you don't even know where to plug in. In fact, there are, uh, uh, depending on who you talk to, as many as 18 emergency service functions. And this is how they tend to get organized. There's operations, planning, logistics, and finance and administration. And we have things like uh, uh, infrastructure support, which is ESFs 1, 2, 3, 8, 12, and 9. Or we look for uh, search and rescue. That's ESF 9. All of those plug in to these general management categories. And understanding how your site organizes and uh, rolls out this system of command is tremendously important. Because if you look at the, uh, I don't have it handy, but if you were to look at these different tasks, uh, emergency services, human services, infrastructure support, community recovery, mitigation, law enforcement, site remediation, you can go through every one of these and find some GIS functions. So the question is, where do you, as GIS professionals, plug into this chain of command? And it's not very clear, and it hasn't been well defined. And that emphasizes even more the importance of getting involved, practicing and training, and coming up with a standardized approach before the crisis occurs. 
Now, inherent in all of this is our ability to shoot, move, and communicate geospatially. Um, <clears throat> as mentioned, the emergency response community has learned this and implements this through standards. Now, OpenTL are uh, the links on the screen here from the emergency management perspective. Where do you go to get started in learning how this operates? So if you hit training.fema.gov forward slash IS, you can take four classes. They would be ICS 100, ICS 200, ICS 700, and ICS 800. They're each about an hour, and this is how you can learn about the incident command system. And I recommend anybody who wants to be involved in crisis emergency operations take these classes. Here in Mississippi, they are a requirement for anybody who wants to mumble the word GIS in or as part of a response planning mitigation or recovery activity. Specific to search and rescue, the National Search and Rescue Committee, which is comprised of seven federal, federal agencies, have come together and said, hey, here are some standards that apply to geospatial that we're going to use for uh, land search and rescue. Wildland Fire uh, has some standards and uh, uh, cues that folks should key on. Uh, that's at gis.nwcg.gov. Then lastly, and this kills me, even with our own, within our own professional community, we, we seem to have forgotten that there are standards that are supposed to drive how we work. Uh, how many are familiar with all of the pertinent FGDC standards uh, that would apply to crisis and emergency response? FGDC, what's that? Yeah, it's those folks down in Washington, D.C. that use consensus processes to create standards, or your state standards. Uh, how does all that come together? If you're going to start shipping data around and sharing in, during a response, if you don't have metadata, or if the data isn't in a standard format, et cetera, all those things are going to bite you in the rear end and make life very, very difficult. Now, I'll also share something that's kind of embarrassing to a lot of emergency responders, and that is we really don't know where we're going more often uh, than we'd ever care to admit. And on screen here is a photograph uh, of coastal Mississippi post landfall from Hurricane Katrina. Well, I have lots of sympathy for folks in the lower ninth ward of uh, Louisiana or more recent victims of storms. This is what a 60 mile wide by, as in certain places, 30 miles inland sized area looked like post landfall Hurricane Katrina. We try to navigate in this environment and it's damn near impossible. You want to communicate and go to Main Street. Well, where is it? Uh, where's the street sign? Where's the house numbers? Folks who had lived here for decades were completely lost. And then take folks that are coming from out of state to render aid, and they have no earthly idea where they're going. This problem compounds in a place like Haiti, for which you see an overhead shot of here. Now we've shaken everything in the little itty bitty pieces and laid it out in the street so you have mountains of rubble to climb over. Then on top of that, any sign that's left standing is in a foreign language. Uh, in fact, you still find this in some neighborhoods in some places. You can go crawl around neighborhoods in Houston where everything is in Chinese or outside of New Orleans where everything is in French. Uh, it's very, very challenging. <clears throat> and then it compounds with scary things like this. And, and I'll show you a couple of, of cases here. Um, we like to be very confident as responders that we have computer-aided dispatch systems that will help us get on scene quickly. Now, when uh, Clinton and Obama were facing off in the primaries, they were in Houston, Texas, stumping. And Clinton's motorcade made its way back to Dallas Love Field. One of the motorcycle officers, Senior Corporal Vincent Lo uh, Lozana, crashed into a bridge abutment at about 80 miles an hour on his motorcycle, and he died. And that's horrible and tragic, but even more so was that it took 11 minutes to get an ambulance on scene. 
Why? Because the connectivity rules within that CAD system for how street segment analysis and closest unit were determined just didn't factor in on and off ramps and where the available units were with respect to those. Instead, it was looking at, oh, geez, here's an ambulance that's only half a mile away. Forget that it has to drive you know, 10 miles to get back on the freeway. That's kind of an aside. I saw a, a very interesting little news clip it come out uh, that talked about a neighborhood in Florida that's finally built out. And there are two properties uh, in adjacent neighborhoods that share a common property line. But to get to the front door, these are two houses that back up to each other. But to drive around and knock on the other guy's front door was a 20-minute drive, uh, seven miles we get there. As we build out these urban environments, uh, everybody likes to have their nice little gated community, and we're finding that basic connectivity rules that we would have done are falling apart. Well, I can go on about that one. Uh, I want to show you this kind of cute little video here. That's not so cute. I'm going to put you on speakerphone. So here comes the battalion chief off to a fire. And along comes the fire truck. Go get them, boys. Paramedic. Fire truck going again. Wait a minute. You think he's lost? As emergency responders, we don't like it when this happens, but I can about guarantee it happens 10, maybe even 20% of the time where we don't, we think we know where we're going, but our board of supervisors is named three pecan roads, none of them next to each other. The public notices. This is a problem. Even when we know where we're going, this is an instance shown here where uh, Maryland Trooper 2 crashed uh, um, in low visibility conditions. Uh, let's see if I can switch this back over. They're still there? All right, good. Maryland Trooper 2 uh, lifted off in marginal weather conditions from the scene of an accident and crashed. Uh, en route to Baltimore shock trauma. The locator beacon on the helicopter uh, fired off and showed where it went down and showed up on an FAA radar screen. The FAA read the coordinate and provided it to the uh, emergency response community and they read something like, and I don't know the exacts here, but it was like 33, 44, 27, uh, 108, 15, 26. And the person on the receiving end of that took that to be uh, um, uh, degrees, minutes, seconds, when in fact it was being provided as decimal degrees. So all the responders started looking in the wrong place for where this crash happened. Now, mind you, this is in a major metropolitan area, and it delayed the responders from getting on scene by over two hours. There were two survivors in this crash. They got to lay soaked in JP5 for uh, that time period in drizzling rain, screaming out for help uh, when they were less than 100 meters from a roadway. Yet we couldn't find them just because we weren't communicating coordinates correctly. Now, one of the ways uh, um, we started tackling some of this is by talking about standards that the geospatial community can bring to the table. I have in front of you kind of a, a design that we rolled out. In fact, we released this during Irene through uh, one of our map services here, where we're building out our map book or atlas products based on coordinate space rather than an administrative and political boundaries. And so what you see here is we've divided the pages. We figured out, A, the responders told us, hey, Bubba, we can't print on those fancy plotters. We can only do 8.5 by 11 sheets, and that's the only one we're at the fire station. Okay, message received, design requirement, 8.5 by 11 paper. 
And then we need to be able to navigate with this product on the ground just like a soldier would on a battlefield. We've got to be able to pull coordinates off of it. We can't use lat long because that's spherical. We don't know how far a degree of longitude is. That's impossible to count with a pace count. Okay, gotcha. Got to be a grid-based coordinate system. So we used US National Grid. By and large, that helped us come up with a product that looks like this. Um, we rolled this out statewide in uh, Missouri, where we have an overview page. Each individual page is numbered by the easting and northing for the lower left-hand corner. And we cut everything out uh, at 1 to 25,000 scale so that an individual page looks something like this. And I wanted to hop out of here and give you all a quick demonstration of that. Here's Andrew County, Missouri. This has been published out as a GeoPDF. You'll see at the lower right corner of the screen, this PDF document is enabled um, such that it's reading both the MGRS and lat long. And let me find an intelligent looking page here, if there is one. Here we'll go to 4020. I've hyperlinked these pages together. And I can come in and I can use all of the tools. And this is a little more uh, than what you'll get in um, uh, uh, ESRI's uh, geo-enabled PDF. I actually have attribute information enabled here. Uh, if I can figure out how to use my tools, I uh, shouldn't have upgraded. Oh, analysis. So I can come in the object data tool, and I could click on a school, for example, and I can find, because that's embedded into what I'm doing here, that that's Savannah Middle School and the street address is 701 West Chestnut. And I can hover over it and pull the coordinate off of it. I can measure. I can measure distances and areas. I have the ability to turn layers on and off. So I can come in here and say, you know, uh, I don't necessarily want to look at the topo, but I do want to see imagery. So I can turn off uh, one and turn on the other. I've also built into here adjacency hyperlinks. So if I'm driving up this road, which, by the way, if you have a USB GPS in this type of product, you can slap it into the back of your laptop or enable the one on your iPad and cruise around and actually drive on this PDF. It's kind of cool. So as I move north, I can click and I can get the next page to the north or the next one over to the east, etc. This is a type of very, very simple map. There ain't anything horribly complicated about it. But because it was driven by standards, we've got a standard scale. I can put a, a USNG Roamer or something off and pull a coordinate off of it. I can work on this in digital format. I can work on it in hard copy format. It's really interoperable. This tool is very, very powerful in the hands of responders. And in fact, you see this for Cape Girardeau. This map went live just in time to be used during the Joplin tornado. So what's at the base of this? Well, that GeoPDF concept, ISO 15000 is the standard for GeoPDF according to OGC. Uh, we pulled out some of the military standards for military grid reference system, et cetera, and the US National Grid, and plugged them in to make that product and communicated that statewide within the state of Missouri. Uh, folks know how to use this. They train and practice with it. And then we've worked with the vendor community to integrate this approach so that products that they're selling in the state are enabled with, it, with uh, US National Grid, for example. So standards promote interoperability, and they facilitate efficiency. They help us prevent that loss scenario that you saw before. And they also help the geospatial professionals work and collaborate together far more effectively because we've designed around requirements, enforced that with standards, and provided that training and education. Now, this may or may not play here. I don't know. We'll find out. No, it's not going to play. I've got a slide here with uh, Tommy Lee Jones and the Fugitive. And I uh, just wanted to give another case study with this, with uh, uh, search and rescue in particular. When we do land search and rescue, it's an exercise in high school math and geography. We worry about the probability of detection. If a person goes missing in an open field with vegetation no higher than a foot tall, I might be able to search that field with four or five people. But the same sized area is covered with dense uh, shrubbery and forest that's uh, more than six feet tall. 
it's going to take far more folks out in that area to search and find that person. When they go missing, how far can they get in a certain amount of time? Again, are they climbing up steep, craggy hills, or is this relatively open range? Uh, uh, can I contain the area that I have to search for folks in? And lastly, we measure this all against what's called probability of success. If you were thinking of a map product to support search and rescue, you might go back to something that's old that really is new again. Uh, a lot of what we require is just a simple topographic map to perform some of these tasks. And here you see it being used in an actual search. You know, I hear a lot of moaning and groaning from GIS professionals saying, oh, well, we can't use the topo. The last one in our area was updated in 1968. In fact, you're probably right. However, unless somebody has picked up and moved a mountain, the topography hasn't changed. If you couple this with aerial photography in a PDF product or provide the two side by side, you have something that, again, becomes very, very powerful in planning and responding to an emergency situation. And guess what? There's national coverage for this. I can go to the USGS store, bang in a USNG coordinate or a place name, and come up with either the US topo product, which has imagery and the terrain integrated together, or an older topo. I can download those. I can cut them out and distribute them on 8.5 by 11 product, or we can do it through uh, uh, loading ESRI base map services, however you want to want to ring the bell on this. Just understand what the need is for the products that you're creating and distributing, because that's really what what's driving the bus here. So, you know, this is a multidisciplinary event, understanding needs and the variety of infrastructures, et cetera, how willing stakeholders are to play together. They all come together, and they're part of how we roll out GIS for crisis and emergency management. And I wanted to kind of just close sharing a, a couple of examples here. Um, I want to talk about Haiti and, and kind of how that went down. Uh, I had actually been in D.C. for a volunteer information working group meeting at the USGS. Uh, they were very interested in using crowdsourcing to help supplement or build out the data that goes into the national map. And I got off the plane, and Joe Tolland, who is the, was the JAS guy for one of the FEMA incident management teams, called and said, hey, uh, big earthquake in Haiti. We need some maps. I've got to be there in 18 hours. I'll talk to you when I get there. And I said, uh, OK, I'll try to help. And we searched and searched for digital map data. And the best thing that I came up with is what you see on screen now. This was a map made uh, 30 years ago by the Defense Mapping Agency at some kind of bizarre scale that had been scanned and georeferenced. And you can see the wonderful labels and everything. Oh, wait, there aren't any. All I've got is basically some line work and polygons and some contours and things like that. And <clears throat> oh, geez, uh, I also happen to notice that this thing is uh, got a thousand meter grid lines on it, which is fantastic, and it's georeferenced to NAD27. OK, got it. Well, turns out when I actually looked at it, there's two sets of tick marks on here, one for NAD27 and one for NAD83. Uh, uh, and when whoever georeferenced this, they georeferenced it to the wrong set of tick marks. So it took us a couple of hours of scrambling around, figuring out why things weren't measuring and marking out right to realize it had been georeferenced to the wrong datum. Well, we got all that squared away and then started looking and going, boy, this is a pretty crappy map. And about that time, we were able to get in contact with uh, some folks from OpenStreetMap, from Yushihidi, uh, from other folks who were trying to stand up and respond to this crisis and get plugged in. And uh, what was just absolutely a Herculean effort, we saw the OpenStreetMap community take what was about 9,000 street segments and go to over 70,000 in a period of 72 hours and be able to share that data. Google uh, worked with GOI to share out imagery. And this is the same area. We went from that to this in a period of 72 hours. Uh, 
by harnessing uh, that open source community and using tools like Yushihidi, which is just absolutely amazing. And <clears throat> Yushihidi and OpenStreetMap are providing that data. And again, we were able to take that then, and I'll just move through, and translate those into GeoPDFs, share them with Harvard, share them back with FEMA, and put those 8.5 by 11 map formats, similar to what you saw from Missouri, in play uh, uh, for Haiti. Um, but it starts talking about some new paradigms, and this is something that's of tremendous value to the emergency response community. But again, unless we train and talk about it, we really don't understand very well. Now, I know you all suffered through uh, uh, Irene and all the flooding that followed, and probably have learned some of these same lessons. You know, what we thought of as authoritative data isn't always so authoritative, right? I have that map from DMA that had been geo-referenced incorrectly. But I also learned that volunteered and crowdsourced data can be of tremendous value. Uh, but I also learned it was difficult to work with, right? If you've ever tried to deal with OSM data, how streets are segmented or the availability of geotags and how they're populated and in what language is a nightmare. In fact, when I first started looking at some of the data for uh, Haiti, uh, I thought that Fords were really popular cars and trucks down there because there's all kinds of streets named or street segments named Ford. Well, it took me a little while and I finally caught on that, oh, Ford is a grade level water crossing. It's not actually the name of the street. So understanding that data and working with it in advance is, is another challenge. Uh, I throw some of these crit criticisms at, uh, like HISIP, for example, um, what's put out by Homeland Security to be used during a time of crisis. Well, it's there. There's 600 plus layers, but nobody can touch it until there's a presidential declaration, or it's very difficult to get your hands on it. We've learned that as spatial technologies advance the level of technical competence to contribute data or to interact with complex geospatial systems is decreasing dramatically because of the simplicity of the tool sets. And so this creates a number of conundrums we need to evaluate when applying geospatial in this, in this uh, arena. You know, when is the use of crowdsourced data appropriate? Who owns that data and under what license and how can it be used and shared? What's the intrinsic financial value of professionally collected authoritative geospatial data? And when do we need to require that? And when is crowdsource or alternative source data uh, 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 um, acceptable? And lastly, how does somebody protect sensitive or restricted data? And on this, I'll close out and share kind of a funny story. And there's, I'm sure the question list goes on and on. But we got called upon to do some fundamental map reading and land navigation training for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agencies uh, in Springfield, Virginia. And we got warned to do this about six months out from the actual event and said, OK, great. Uh, can you guys send us some imagery so we can use it in creating the base map for a land navigation course at the National, National uh, NCE East? And I said, oh, no, no, uh, we don't know that we can do that. We're an intelligence agency, you know, national intelligence oversight. We can't spy on the American people, so we can't give you imagery of, of anywhere in the United States, blah, blah, blah. But I finally said, well, we'll buy some and then give it to you. And I got imagery that had 10-meter pixels. Then we get about two weeks out, and I'm finally getting frustrated with these folks, and, and they can't provide data or share it for their facility. And so we went out on our own and started creating our own base map for, for uh, 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 the Puzzle Palace there in Virginia. And you see the resulting map on screen. In fact, it's uh, six-inch resolution imagery. And we were able to put about 30 different layers, including parking spaces and trees and even uh, the building floor plans together from what's actually available out there in the public space. In fact, I was even able to come up with photographs of the inside of the building that you see down the lower right uh, <laughs> from public sources and put it into this map of this super secret government facility. And we bundled it up and sent it off. And about <clears throat> five minutes after I sent it, I got a phone call from my point of contact there. And he said, boy, that's great. I'm glad to see they were finally able to come through with the data issue. 
and, and get all this resolved. And I said, yeah, we didn't get this information from any of y'all. And I got about 30 seconds of silence, and it came back, well, just where did you get it? You know, I had to throw in the jackass factor here, and I said, I'm sorry, sir, that is need-to-know information. <laughs> <laughs> they did not like that response and uh, jumped back at me. In the meantime, one of my colleagues is wandering around in the back of the room here going, bing, every 30 seconds, bing. <laughs> he goes, God damn it, what's that noise? I said, oh, it's bing. We got the imagery from bing maps. What? Yes, sir. We pulled all this stuff from publicly available sources. So even when you try to keep it super secret, guess what? It's not going to work very well. In fact, here's the NCE on uh, New Campus East for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency on OpenStreetMap. <laughs> they were less than thrilled to find that this had been done. Um, this idea goes across all kinds of new and emerging, uh, new and emerging applications. Um, you can play with some of these links. If you haven't used OpenStreetMap or don't do uh, uh, are familiar with the Army's idea of every soldier as a sensor, or USGS's National Map Corps effort, or USRI's community map programs. Um, these are other tools that can be available and effective in crisis and emergency response if you understand what they're doing, if they meet requirements, if they're plugged in and trained upon and set a, uh, backed with standards, etc. So that's kind of my story. Um, uh, I'll stick to it for now until somebody asks a really embarrassing question. <laughs> so, I to give a couple yeah, uh, of shameless, shameless plugs, if you don't mind, uh, uh, Leslie, just quick. To, sure. We have down here at Delta State over 30 courses in geospatial available online. So if I haven't put you to sleep or run you off, please, I'd love to hear from some of you as future students. And then I wanted to make you aware of another webinar. I'm president of GITA and we're putting a webinar on on the 26th of March about GISP uh, mm. because that's another credential that may come into play in rolling GIS into emergency emergency management. Um, we, we as emergency responders need to know who's qualified and trained to do the job, not just who's going to show up and volunteer. And uh, so understanding that process and uh, how it may be integrated potentially into moving GIS into emergency response is an important discussion to have. So I'd invite you all to that on the on the 26th. If you'd like more information, shoot me an email, and I'll I'll send you the connection information for that. And I'll post that up on our calendar at our website. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. So um, so everybody out there, this is your chance to ask questions. Unless Talbot's done such a good job that you really don't have any questions because he's covered it all, um, this is your chance. And if I don't to know the answer, there. I'll make up something that sounds good. There we go. All right, I think I have one here. Let me open this up. Okay, so Pete asks if you can make your slide set available, your PowerPoint, um, and if you can zip that up and send that to me, I can post that at our website. Um, and maybe at the very end here, I'll go back to my website and just show everybody on the new website where the links to um, previous webinars are, even though the, sure, the recordings are all on YouTube now. But. Absolutely. And, okay. And then somebody else asks, will you please show the previous slide so I can write down all the web links? So actually, oh, hopefully sure. that, that also lets you know that if you can't get them all down right now, we will post this uh, PowerPoint so that you can come back to it. And also you can always come back and view the video and just skip to the end. Um, and Pete, who by the way is from the Health Department, the Vermont Health Department, adds, thank you very much. We're working on adding US, US National Grid coordinates to our emergency base maps. Is that the Health yeah, Department? Yeah, in fact, um, let, me, let me show this right quick if I can, I think I can find it. Um, you can see what, and again, this is an example of um, I can't type and talk at the same time. Hmm. Yeah. And I have one more, well, maybe I shouldn't throw a question at you at the same time that you're trying to type. There we go. So when y'all were experiencing Irene, we put up this flex viewer hmm. and uh, rolled it out 
to try to make it available for emergency responders where you could come pull in these uh, 1 to 25,000 page atlas sheets. And here's an example of what was produced. Um, we did this for all over the state of Vermont um, using data that you all made available. And again, set this so you could turn things on and off. But I bet you nobody in the audience has probably even heard of this or aware. And it's a, an example of okay, we weren't plugged in and training and practicing or doing anything with Vermont prior to Irene and just kind of won it. Now, the feds that are connected to us did know that this was available and we were able to work with them on it, but it didn't make it all the way across the, the comprehensive response, and it just mm -hmm. goes to underscore the, the kind of thing I'm trying to get across here. If, if you don't connect and understand needs, man, you're wasting a whole lot of time or not reaching the audience that you, you would like to. Yeah. Uh, there's one other question that says, for areas where cell phones don't operate, are there training materials for cell phone users to read lat long or national grid and relay by voice radio? Why, yes, there are. <laughs> In fact, uh, if we hit um, the FGDC, it's fgdc.gov forward slash USNG. This is everything about the standard, and it includes tons of, uh, it has a, a training map, a sample grid reader, how to read a grid coordinate, nice. are all on that page. Or, if you like, you can go to their training section, and under Access Available Training Materials from FGDC and NSDI stakeholders, all the way down at the bottom, you'll see there's the U.S. National Grid Standard. And uh, I've done two presentations that are available there. One is a big picture on how and why you should use the U.S. National Grid. And then the other is um, uh, here on how to actually read grid coordinates off a map. And so ideally, geospatial folks could go and listen to this once or twice on their own. And we present, oh god, I sound horrible. Uh, we go forward and print these materials and take them to the local fire station and provide some map reading training. You'd be amazed how into it responders get. They're like, oh man, we've been trying to figure out how to deal with some of this for forever. Yeah. It's wonderful. And, and in fact, I'll go as far as if you want me to come do some of this, <laughs> pay for my plane ticket. And I always love Vermont. Uh, 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 I grew up in New York State. so. Uh, if I can get back, let's time it for like September, October for the leaves, right? And maple <laughs> syrup and cheese and apples. I'd be all, all over that. But however I can help, drop me an email and this stuff is here and available. Okay. Um, there was a follow-up to that question. He was clarifying that he actually wanted to figure out how to make the cell phone display the lat long from the internal GPS chip, which I don't think you can do. If you have the type well, of cell you know, phone that doesn't... It, it's Show GPS. It depends. It depends on the device and the operating yeah. system. On, uh, uh, I'll just make folks aware. Um, we discovered a really cool application for Android called GeoCam, mm -hmm. and it actually turns your cell phone into a fully functional theodolite with uh, GPS reading, but it's also doing measurements on uh, angle, angular displacement, tilt, mm -hmm. etc. If you haven't checked that app out, I definitely would recommend it because it really does a, a wonderful job of harnessing uh, your phone's GPS and turning it into a, a very useful tool for land navigation. So can you say what that's called again? It's called Geo... Uh, Geo... Hang on. I've oh, got my phone right here. Geocam, G-E-O-Cam, C-A-M. Okay. All one word, Geocam Free. And cool. I absolutely love it to death. Okay. Any other questions out there before we wrap things up? Oh, there it is. Great. Thank you. Okay. I'm not seeing any more, so I think we're going to probably say thank you to Talbot and thank you to all of you for showing up. And like I said, we will be uh, posting this recorded webinar. Oh, I know. I was going to go back. I'm going to take control back from you, Talbot. Go for it. Those who are still here, I just want to point out on our, point out a couple of things on our website. Um, 
One is the fact that we do have some more webinars coming up in the next few weeks, mapping with census data next week, um, and then a webinar about using our web services, both imagery services and map services at our website uh, the week after that. Some more events coming up a little bit later in the spring. And then, uh, let's see, on our events page, if you go to our events page, you'll see that there's also a link to an event archive. And this is where I can post uh, Talbot's PowerPoint presentation once I put a little listing in here for his his uh, session. All right. Yep, and we'll get, we'll get you that information on the um, GISP uh, lecture. Yes, and I will post that in our in our calendar, which is. If folks aren't a member of GITA, I strongly encourage them to, to visit GITA.org and join up. We're going to start doing some really cool stuff. Great. Thank you very much, Talbot. Thank you for doing this again. <laughs> oh, no problem. Anytime. Anything and I know I we, we had talked at one point about maybe doing a webinar on National Grid. So if you're still interested in doing that, um, we can talk about that. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.